for those of you who, if this is your first time, I welcome you and hope to see you in the upcoming sessions. However, before we get started and I disclose the topics that we will dis, uh, be discussing, I'd like for you to please turn your attention to the hypothetical trading disclaimer on the screen in front of you. Please go ahead and take a look at that. And then once you have read through it, go ahead and get started. All right, <clears throat> let's dive in. So what are the topics that we're going to be discussing? The main one will be, of course, the U.S. presidential election, some updates on the polls, what have we been seeing, obviously the state of fiscal talks, it's been one of the biggest things driving markets. Uh, we're going to take a look at a couple of asset classes, Euro dollar, Aussie dollar, we're going to take a look at the SPX, the, in, um, the uh, NASDAQ index as well. Uh, we're going to be looking through all of these assets, and then I also want to talk about some new developments that we got today regarding the election that is already stirring some volatility. And I'm going to explain a little bit about why that is and what the report is. Furthermore, I also want to give an outlook about why the magnitude of this election is so important and from a market-oriented perspective and why we could be heading into a potentially significant period of volatility. And if you want to stay and learn, and if you want to learn more about that, please be sure to stay on to the webinar. So let's now dive in. Uh, I want to start off by taking a look at some assets to see uh, some asset classes uh, too, to see what they're doing. And then we'll go ahead and dive in. So let's take a look at Euro dollar. So Euro dollar from here was climbing along this uptrend. We did see some uh, stalling at the March swing high here. And if you zoom in, you'll notice that price action got more shy. So we had this candle here, relatively short body, long wick, touched it here, touched the wick here. And then we got what I call a compression zone. Now, a compression zone, in my view, uh, in the way I sort of define it, is the intersection and in the ever-closing area of either support and or resistance and an uptrend and or downtrend. So in this case, we see the uptrend here. And uh, support, uh, resistance here at 1.1447, and the area betw uh, between that began to narrow, which meant that at that point, traders needed to reveal a directional bias, because at one point, this area runs out, and it seems that we got a break higher here. Once we got that break above, we'll notice that price action is relatively bold, and it climbed, and then it entered into this period of congestion here, roughly from the 28th of July. Um, well, really until now, apart from this brief sell-off here. And then it was climbing here, and we saw this top form around this range up between 1.1936 and 1.1965, where it was hovering here. And then here's an example of where we saw a uh, compression zone forming between resistance here and this uptrend. And instead of breaking above higher, like it did here, we saw euro dollar break down, and it shattered this uh, multi-month uptrend. It, was, it broke below the support, but is climbing above it again. And now we saw it climbing. We're seeing euro dollar decline. That appears not necessarily to be the function necessarily of a weaker euro so much as a stronger U.S. dollar. If you'd like to know the catalyst behind that, I'm going to get into that in just a moment. I want to look at Aussie dollar in the context of a stronger U.S. dollar. So take a look at Aussie dollar right here. Yet again, we see another compression zone forming. But I want to go back a little bit. We saw it climbing here. And then we saw the swing high, uh, or this rather swing high at the December 2018 high at 0.7393. We subsequently saw it decline. We saw a really aggressive selling about here at the same time and saw the US dollar appreciating. That's why around the same period, we saw Euro dollar falling to a, less, to a lesser extent, perhaps, um, because the Australian dollar is a cycle sensitive asset to the extent that it responds to changes in global sentiment much more quickly in a much more sensitive manner relative to the euro. So let's see what we have here. We see that Aussie dollar, since topping there, has not only been on a downturn, but has been trading below descending resistance. We have the form here, retest, retest, capitulation, 
retest capitulation, and now a compression zone appears to be forming between this descending resistance line and this swing high here in January before we got the sell-off in March. Uh, turned, uh, and I call it an inflection point because it sort of oscillates between being resistance and support. Now it's functioning as support, but if it breaks below it, uh, this will then turn into resistance. That's uh, 0 0.7018. 0 if it breaks below that, we may see selling pressure start abating at these two levels here at 0 0.6829 and 0 0.6774. That's where we may see uh, a little bit of downside friction if selling pressure um, persists. At that point, though, even though the fundamentals may not align from a market-oriented perspective, Traders may look at that and think, well, is this maybe a bottom? Should we just buy in here? Not necessarily maybe because they believe it has any reason to go up other than their perception that other people believe it will go up. And that, that is something uh, I, I've actually seen uh, quite a number of times. Now, what is driving Aussie dollar and Euro dollar lower? Again, it seems to be more of a function of a weakening, or rather of a strengthening US dollar following this report from Politico, but of course other news agencies had it. National security officials on Wednesday announced that Iran and Russia have obtained swaths of voter registration information that could support their efforts to interfere in the 2020 presidential election. If you look at a colleague Daniel Moss's Twitter, I highly recommend you follow. You'll notice here, around the same time, so we have the S&P 500 and ASX 200 future sliding after, again, this same report came out. And very correctly, labeling this uh, as a risk-sensitive asset, Australian dollar has been losing ground while the quote-unquote safe haven slash anti-risk Japanese yen and U.S. dollar have been rising. If you want to see more tweets like that, again, highly recommend you follow him here. It's at Daniel Moss. <clears throat> so let's go back. So this FBI report, the reason why this is so significant is because already geopolitical tensions between the US and not only its allies, but its adversaries as well, is particularly high. Iran, in light of the um, uh, sort of tension that we saw in the region uh, amid the various drone attacks, as well as uh, Soleimani, um, and we can actually go back to that and we can look at how crude oil prices have been affected by um, geopolitical shocks. I'm gonna pull it up here. Uh, but while I continue, uh, and with Russia, of course, there are still tensions floating in the air over uh, the U U.S. officials um, being angered over uh, the reports of Russia being involved in the 2016 election and their interference therein. And it appears now that what the report indicates is that both Iran and Russia are attempting to uh, implement a sort of cyber attack in order to reelect um, Donald Trump for another four years. Now, what is the manifestation and what will U.S.-Iran relations look like under potentially another four years of Trump? And what have we seen happen just in the past two years? So here, and I wanna walk through this because these are actual tangible reflections of how politics can impact markets. So if you'll notice here to the very left, U.S. announces end of Iran importing waivers. Well, we saw crude oil prices surge. That's because this, uh, what I have frequently called in my articles, um, politically induced supply disruption fears or news caused prices to rise on speculation that the increased scarcity would cause prices to rise. So it's fairly intuitive. Then you'll notice here in, uh, in uh, summer in June and July, you had oil at uh, tankers attacked in the Strait of Hormuz and then you saw a U.S. drone was shot down uh, later within that uh, multi-month interim. And then in general, you can see here toward the right that uh, Iran, there were just various exchanges between the U.S. and Iran that saw uh, tensions just generally dramatically rise. Um, and like I said here, the wording has become more aggressive. And then here we have the biggest one-day increase in oil prices ever recorded when Houthi rebels who were reportedly and widely believed by the U.S. government to be backed by Iran, fired on the Saudi Arabian Aramco oil processing facility 
and caused uh, prices to jump uh, in their highest 24-hour periods. I think it was over 20% in a single day. Now, there we saw a very interesting dynamic. We have some petroleum-linked currencies like the Swedish krona to a certain extent, um, certainly the Norwegian krona and the Canadian dollar. Now, correlation does not equal causation. And what's interesting is that while oil prices rose, the Norwegian krona and Swedish krona, despite being a affiliated, not affiliated, but somewhat tied, but not entirely, um, and somewhat closely follow crude oil prices, they fell, while crude oil prices themselves rose. What that appeared to tease out is that the Swedish krona and Norwegian krona, this is where they differ from crude oil prices in terms of their price action to the extent that in that moment, they acted as a risk-oriented asset, not necessarily as a petroleum-linked currency, which rose uh, not, not with rose, sorry, when crude oil prices rose amid supply disruption fears um, from this uh, attack on that oil processing facility. So that was a really interesting dynamic to see how, again, how correlation does not equal causation, just because they follow it some of the time, that is the Swedish krona, the Norwegian krona, and the Canadian dollar with crude oil prices, it didn't follow it the same way. And that is a key aspect to tease out. Here, the beginning of 2020 of what has turned out so far to be a very tumultuous year. Uh, Qasem Soleimani is killed. We saw crude oil prices jump. And then here, the OPEC 6 meeting, uh, the OPEC uh, meeting on March 6th, uh, where Russia and Saudi Arabia, amid what was already uh, the start of the coronavirus pandemic, when we saw that massive sell from global equities, when they both declared essentially a price war, Crude oil price prices plunged amid already dwindling growth prospects that were further amplified by the U.S.-China trade war and just generally trade wars and slower growth around the world, as seen by PMI data. And then we saw this recovery here. We saw crude oil prices rise. We did see some uh, a bit of friction here. As you can see, it entered this range, was congested and broke above. And again, a compression zone formed between this drop-off here and this uptrend, and it capitulated. And now, for a while, we were again seeing this, another uptrend. And you can see here how crude oil prices really didn't want to make a decision. As the area narrowed, the refusal to break lower wasn't there until finally it broke below. And then we didn't see it climb higher, capitulation, and we saw a decline. And now it's somewhat trading sideways. In my view, this sideways trading, along with assets like the S&P, the Australian dollar versus the U.S. dollar, here, it's for lesser extent we did see um, equity prices rise. But with crude oil, the reason why we saw that sideways um, price action, the fact that really since, um, I want to look at here most recently, since August 20th, or 26th rather, the S&P hasn't really moved anywhere. And that, I think, in my view, is a reflection of the uncertainty around U.S. fiscal stimulus stocks. The reason why there's such a premium put on this now is because the prior provisions of the prior stimulus package, the CARES Act, have expired or are about to expire. The main ones really have. And as a result, that initial stimulus combined with the initial monetary stimulus from monetary authorities um, has also waned to a certain extent, where the Fed has repeatedly said there's only so much we can do to create demand. At some point, it boils down to federal authorities. And he's repeated that at sev several um, of his testimonies to Congress, including the Senate Banking Committee uh, a few months ago. So that's why there's such a premium being put on these talks. And the fact that it's been so uh, back and forth, and uh, you've been seeing uh, moments of bipartisan intransience, it's been having an impact on sentiment. And the fact, and that this is amplified by the fact that the Fed chair has been emphasizing the importance of it, while also, of course, respecting um, the fact uh, that um, it's not his prerogative necessarily to um, discuss anything politically related. So walking that fine line, of course, was very, very interesting. So that's what we have with fiscal talks that are going on. And the most recent development is that um, Nancy Pelosi has spoken with Stephen Mnuchin, they've been in constant contact today, they had a 45-minute call and uh, there has been some progress that has been made, according to uh, uh, Pelosi's uh, spokesman. Uh, however, there's still a lot of large gaps, mostly on local and state aid 
in addition to liability protections for businesses. Those seem to really be the big sticking points. The prospect of another round of $1,200 stimulus checks appears to be popular on both sides. It, it was weird. Initially, it was popular. Then it wasn't. Now it appears to be, again, something that um, both Rep Republicans and Democrats want to put in. Um, and that appeared to help jumpstart the economy along with the other fiscal provisions uh, that came with the first aid package. So that's where we are right now. And of course, the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg certainly didn't help what was already a very polarized Congress in a very polarizing election. Um, and that made it even more, <coughs> pardon me, that made it even more difficult, which is, again, a manifestation of how politics can tangibly impact financial markets, um, especially now in light of this election and its wide ranging implications. With the next major political event we have to watch for is the third, well, technically second presidential debate. The first one, as uh, we all know, it was difficult to hear each um, candidate's respective positions. Um, and then the second one was canceled. And then the third one will be occurring uh, tomorrow, or if it's in GMT terms, technically uh, today. Uh, so in, in that regard, uh, well, GMT terms will be the 23rd. Anyways, so we will be seeing that development. It's unclear how much of an impact it will have on markets. But having said that, if you look at, uh, so I like to use Real Clear Politics's um, uh, betting odds, you'll notice here that prior to the first debate, we did see this convergence here before the crossover uh, here in June. And then right after the first debate, we saw this, mar we saw this uh, margin here explode, and we saw it widen to its uh, uh, widest spread ever at 34.7 points. But now recently, we've been seeing some convergence and a slight widening again. It still appears to be overwhelmingly, uh, markets seem to be overwhelmingly expecting for Mr. Biden to um, win, but we are seeing uh, this slight reversal here. And it was interesting because at the, at the time that we saw this reversing, we still saw polls going up uh, in regards to Mr. Biden. So that's something very important to keep in mind. You also have what's called um, a differential nonpartisan response. And essentially what that is, stripping away all of the ornate language, is if you are voting, if your candidate for a particular party is performing poorly in the polls, you are less likely to answer surveys about this respective candidate, which means you may not have an accurate picture of what the overall voting block is for this individual. And as such, that could set markets up with a false sense of certainty as to who will take the White House. Now, here's where the volatility kicks in and what I mentioned earlier. If we see polls continue to suggest that Mr. Biden will take the White House, investors and portfolio managers will allocate assets within their portfolio that will be optimized in the new geopolitical landscape, i.e., a Biden administration and all the various implications therein. If they get comfortable with that and, abs and more certain, but then Mr. Trump takes the White House yet again, that sudden shift from their expectations to what the reality is, and because the magnitude of what each can respective candidate will bring to the uh, domestic and global economy is so large, that may cause a knee-jerk reaction, and you may see volatility surge, especially now with concerns about election interference and what that may mean for legitimacy and what procedures may be in place for a recount or for various other uh, legal provisions. That could prolong that level of uncertainty. And what markets ultimately don't like is uncertainty, because if they have a candidate that they prefer or don't prefer from an economic perspective, if they know who the candidate is, that's a degree of certainty. If they don't even know who the candidate is, that's a lot of uncertainty. The natural, the natural next question is, what will various asset classes do potentially and how will they perform in this uncertain environment? If you see the premium being put on liquidity over returns, you may then see uh, as currencies like the haven-linked US dollar rise. Because while the real return on it is negative when taking into account the nominal interest rate and inflation, 
if you're just trying to not lose money, or at least, or if you're not trying to lose money, or, or at least not lose any more, you will prioritize liquidity and turning your money into cash. You're turning your assets into cash much faster and much more than uh, trying to make more money in this environment. You may see then the U.S. dollar rise along with the unloading of carry trades, and you may then see the uh, the anti-risk Japanese yen rise, perhaps to a certain degree, the Swiss franc as well. Conversely, growth anchored assets like we saw early, the Australian dollar may fall. And may see the New Zealand dollar fall as well. Uh, crude oil may as well, because again, it's a cycle sensitive asset, precisely because also because crude oil is used in so many industries. It's, in my view, a very helpful barometer to gauge what global demand is looking like. I, I, and for that, you can also use uh, another um, cyclically sensitive asset like copper. For example, which has hit a two-year high, two and a half year to be specific. But digression aside, you may then see those assets fall. You may see emerging markets take a little bit of a hit as well, uh, as well as emerging market currencies like uh, the Indian rupee. Um, so that's something certainly to keep in mind. So the presidential debate will be tomorrow, um, and th the microphones will be muted for while one candidate speak. So while one candidate is speaking, the other will have theirs muted. So that's where we are with those political updates. Uh, we can now touch on Brexit. Now, I've said this before, and I will say it again, but hopefully not for much longer. Brexit is an absolute mess, but we are getting closer to where we need to be. So here, we saw the British pound rise versus the US dollar after UK and US, um, EU officials agreed to restart trade talks. This appeared to have a positive market. Uh, reaction to the extent that it meant perhaps greater cooperation um, and their uh, a commitment to want to have a deal by mid-November. Mind you, they said they wanted to have a deal by October 15th, and it's now the 21st. So this keeps getting delayed, and markets appear to be speculating that a last-minute deal will break through. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at where Europe has been in the past few years, Betting against the euro, and to the extent that it means uh, if you're betting on lack of political cohesion in the long term, appears to have not paid off. So what I mean by that is if you look at the coronavirus um, stimulus negotiations, those negotiations lasted several days longer than they needed to and almost set a record, I believe. But ultimately, at the end, they pulled through. Yields fell. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yields, uh, yeah, yields fell on... Um, uh, structurally sensitive uh, sovereigns like Italy, Portugal, and Greece, while well, you saw the euro rally as a sort of political side relief, or what I like to call a relief rally. It appears here that this same, appears to be that same function, that they are betting on UK and EU policymakers to work out a deal. The biggest obstacle so far has been concerns about uh, fishing rights. Um, not to get too much into it, but from the EU perspective, it seems to have strategic economic value as well as the UK. But with the UK, there's something a little more deeper and personal to the extent that they view it as a reclamation of their sovereignty, which carries the same ideological undertones of Brexit and its slogans, i.e. take our country back. So the sentiment there is very in line with the underlying ideological predilections of Brexit. So it seems to be a very sensitive area. So in that regard, it's not surprising that we're seeing this continue to be such an issue. But now we're seeing GBP USD decline a little bit. Again, it appears to be less the function of a weaker British pound, more the function of a stronger US dollar. Uh, however, before, and that's really all I have for you today, I wanted to leave uh, five minutes to answer any questions you might have. Um, uh, regarding any of the topics we have discussed. I just uh, got this uh, question here. Would you please touch upon your view on the latest Brexit impacts on GDP, USD, and other relevant assets? So I think we just uh, covered that. And I know there's a question about USD INR earlier, and I think we covered that too. Um, but I'm now open to receiving any questions you might have over any of the topics that we have discussed.
Okay, there appear to be no more questions related to the topics we've discussed. Before you go, some important reminders. Uh, again, if you like these sort of talks, you like seeing this analysis, yeah, you can hear, follow me here on Twitter. It's at Zabellin Dimitri. Again, also, I highly encourage you to follow my colleague, Daniel Moss. It's Daniel IG Moss. I have a question here. Uh, last one before I go. How would Brexit impact the euro? Uh, so, in my view, I think you might see a risk off. In, in my view, I think you would see a risk off tilt. It kind of depends when you say, how does it impact the euro? The euro against what? So, I think that you might see euro pound rise, and but that may be less the function of a weakening euro, or sorry, a strengthening euro so much as a um, uh, weakening pound. Now, against the US dollar, I think if you get a, a no deal Brexit and it's very sudden, I think that a premium may be put on haven linked assets like the US dollar and you may see the dollar rise relative to the euro. Again, not necessarily because the euro is falling, but because there may be increased demand for liquidity and the dollar offers that to a greater extent than the euro does. Okay, uh, before we go, please take a look at this hypothetical trading disclaimer on the screen in front of you. I wanna thank you all again uh, for attending this webinar. If this is your first time, I hope you got a lot out of it. If you've been with me from the beginning, I thank you again for your dedicated 